So uh, good evening, everybody, or good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Paul Harrison, on, and on behalf of the Ho Center for Buddhist Studies at Stanford, I would like to welcome you to this event and uh, to extend a especially warm welcome to our uh, guest speaker today, who's um, speaking to us in the series, um, the TT and WF Child Distinguished Practitioner Series. And it's a very great pleasure to welcome this evening or uh, this morning for, for her, uh, the Venerable Dr. Uh, Vidita Dharma, who is um, beaming to us from uh, Vietnam. Um, the Venerable Bhikkhuni Vidita Dharma um, uh, was born in 1967 in Hue, Vietnam, and was initially trained in a teacher's training college, majoring in English. But um, graduating from the training college, she entered the Sangha and, and became a nun first in the Mahayana tradition and then the Theravada, which I'm interested in asking her about later. And um, completed her training first in Vietnam and then in, in India, where she completed advanced studies in Pali and in Buddhism, eventually earning a PhD in uh, Buddhist studies at the University of Delhi, majoring in Pali and Abhidharma. And um, she was fully ordained in uh, Sri Lanka in 2002 and has been part of the international movement to um, revive and extend the ordination of women. Um, and has been active in her native Vietnam uh, since then as a, a teacher of Buddhism and as an academic. She is now deputy head of the Department of Dharma English at Vietnam Buddhist University in Ho Chi Minh City, and she is also the abbess of Bien Cong Nunnery. Now, given the fact that uh, the, the Buddhism of Vietnam is rather um, uh, understudied and uh, we might even say um, passed over in, in the academia. It's a very great pleasure to have you here today, uh, the Venerable Vidita Dharma. And, and so I'd like to start by asking you, first of all, to tell us a bit about yourself and your own path into the Sangha and, and why you became a Buddhist nun. So welcome. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, send my greetings to all the participants today. Um, and uh, I would also would like to uh, uh, show my uh, gratitude to uh, the university as well as uh, Venerable Tata Loka Terry, uh, my senior and close friends who uh, introduced me uh, to this uh, meeting. Um, as Professor Rig uh, introduced to you, uh, I am uh, Bhikkhuni Vidita Dhamma from Vietnam. Uh, Vidita Dhamma is a Pali name. Oh, sorry. Could, could you hear me clearly? First of yes. all, I would like to confirm whether yeah. everyone can hear clearly. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Vidita Dhamma is a Pali name. English Vidita means understood. Uh, and Dhamma means uh, the truth or reality. So my name is uh, translated into Chinese as uh, Liao Fa, uh, understanding the Dhamma or the truth. And in Vietnamese, we pronounce Liu Fa. Um, uh, I'm 54 years old and I have been a nun for 30 years uh, since 1991. Um, Right after my graduation from a university, I decided to become a nun because um, I think uh, I saw the suffering in life. Uh, you see that uh, I was born in uh, 67 and I have uh, a face with the, the civil war in Vietnam. Only six months after my birth, my family ha had to run away um, in a war, and after we came back, our house uh, was burned down. And then uh, in 72, uh, when I was only five years old, again, we had to be, uh, to be evacuated uh, to the south. 
again, in the final war, 1975, uh, 75, um, do, do, do know that the war, that war is very famous. At the time, I was only eight years old, but uh, we again have to uh, evacuate from our house. And uh, after some months, when we came back, and when I came back to school, many of my friends died in the war due to the bomb or due to uh, uh, be dropped in the sea. So even though I was a small girl, I saw uh, the suffering uh, in the war. And also I saw um, so many problems that my parents had to struggle to make and miss uh, to uh, bring up our big family. Uh, you know that uh, I have 10 brothers and sisters. So uh, it is a big burden for my parents to bring us up. Um, and then I saw uh, uh, around me, my, my brothers and sister, when they have their own families, uh, they also have a lot of problems, financial problem, mental problem, children problem. Uh, so uh, by seeing the reality around me, I think that uh, family life is not ideal. And uh, it means to me a lot of burden. So I prefer to choose a path of freedom. And because I am a Buddhist, so I saw that the Buddha's way to go alone and to help people in our way uh, is the ideal part of life for me. That is why um, I selected the uh, monastic life. And uh, you know that uh, in my view, in my view about the marriage, uh, we have the we have the the joke that um, when you got uh, when you got in love first when you get engaged you give each other engaged ring, then when you get married you give each other wedding ring, and after that when you live together then you give each other suffering. <laughs> so this is uh, my way of uh, about <laughs> attachment to. Uh, uh, in a relationship. Uh, so that is how I became a man, to lead a, a life um, away from attachment, from clinging and uh, uh, relationship. And I chose the three way of life as the Buddha chose in the past. Okay, thank, thank you. Could you tell us a bit more about your involvement in the international movement to um, promote the ordination of women? Uh, pardon, can, can you repeat the question? Could, I can't could, hear your could question. Could you tell us a bit more well. about your involvement in the international movement to promote the ordination of, of bhikkhunis? Uh, uh, yes. Um, I, um, I am in the Theravada tradition. And as you know, uh, the bhikkhuni ordination in Theravada is not uh, recognized fully by the Sangha and by the government in many countries. Uh, in my case, um, I was uh, a Theravada eight precept nun for 11 years before I could get ordained in Sri Lanka in 2000, well, uh, 2002. Uh, at the time I was studying in India and um, when I attended uh, the Sakatita conference in Nepal, I, got, I came to know that, oh, there, there are Pikunis in the Theravada tradition. But before that, I did not know at all. I was interested in that issue, uh, that Theravada Pikunis is now um, reinstated in India and in 1998. Um, just only two years after that, I came to know. And uh, so I came to Sri Lanka to get fully ordained as a bhikkhuni in Theravada tradition. Uh, together with me, there were three other nuns, uh, my Dharma sisters. We were ordained at the same time. But you know that after that, 
10 years passed, but uh, only two more could get audience like us who went to Sri Lanka for further studies. And most of the nuns in Vietnam did not have the opportunity to go abroad or to get the information about the ordination or about the Pikuni Sangha at all. That is why I have the determination that um, I would like to help the Theravada nuns in Vietnam as well as in Thailand, Malaysia, and India, who has the wish um, to, to be ordained, I will help them to get ordained. That is why in 2012, 10 years after my ordination, together with other Pikuni, senior Pikunis like Venerable Tamananda and Venerable uh, Santini from, uh, from Asia. So we organized the first international Pikuni uh, ordination in Vesali um, in a Vietnamese nunnery. Vesali is the place where the Buddha first accepted the ladies into the Sangha. And uh, Vietnam has a nunnery there. So we choose that as the venue for our ordination. Uh, we brought um, uh, 10 from Vietnam and then 10 also from Thailand, nine from um, uh, India and one from Malaysia. So uh, we invited the CNL Pikus from many other countries like uh, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Cambodia, Bangladesh, um, and uh, India uh, to be our um, receptors and Gamma Vachacharyas. And we also invited the CNL Pikunis from uh, uh, India, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Indonesia, and Vietnam. So uh, we had a very successful ordination ceremony. And after the ordination, I requested all the nuns who had just ordained had to stay in the temple, in Vietnamese temple, to be, or to be trained properly um, in the Dhamma and in the Vinaya so that they can become a good nun uh, who know the Dhamma and the runes very well so that they can live properly in the, tam in the Sangha later. So it was my first um, involvement in the Pikuni Sangha. After that, uh, we also organized a Pikuni training in um, Nagpur, south of India for Indian nuns and also uh, the ordination in uh, Thailand in Indonesia, in Malaysia, in Sri Lanka, and in India. Uh, together, we have uh, the network of uh, Asian Theravada Pikuni Sangha, and we work together um, to organize the ordinations and the training for the nuns, uh, including Pikunis and seminaries uh, on around the Asia regions. And uh, we work together until now. Uh, and last week, we just uh, received uh, one e email from Pante Sivali, a Sri Lankan monk, um, the abbot of the Sri Lankan temple in, uh, in Kolkata, to invite us to organize the next uh, international Pikuni Sang uh, ordination in India, in Bodhagaya again, after two years. Um, we are considering uh, whether we can do it in this uh, pandemic COVID-19 or not. Uh, so this is our involvement in the Pikuni Sangha uh, to reinstate the Pikuni Sangha in Asian uh, Theravada country. And, and do, you, do you consider it fully reinstated in Vietnam or is there still some work to do? I mean, what is the status of the nuns order in your country vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, in relation to the monk's yeah. order? Is it regarded as being on an equal level legally and socially? Or is there much work still to be done? Uh, there is much to be done. Uh, you know, uh, even though now uh, our number of uh, Pikunis and uh, Samaneris is now nearly 100, and we have uh, three temples, nunneries. Uh, we are independent nunneries. Um, 
even though I am recognized as a university lecturer, and I also participate in many activities of the Pikuni Sangha, National Pikuni Sangha. Uh, and also, I also a, a member of uh, the National Sangha in the National Affair. But um, we are not uh, only recognized by the National Sangha at a Pikuni in Theravada tradition because. Um, uh, most of the Theravada monks believe that uh, the Theravada Pikuni Sangha has already disappeared. Uh, and um, based on the law, uh, the, the, rune, the, the Vinaya, it cannot be re-established in the proper way. Um, so they do not uh, recognize us um, uh, officially. Uh, but uh, one good thing for us is that um, even though they don't officially recognize, neither they officially deny us. So we are in an ambiguous uh, situation. We survive, we is it, and um, people know that uh, we are ordained in Theravada tradition, but we don't have the um, national certificate of ordination in Theravada tradition. Our certificate of ordination is only international, uh, not national. And when we apply to get the national certificate, they do not uh, recognize pikunis. They only recognize us as eight precept nuns. And uh, we are trying to persuade the Sangha and the government uh, do fully recognize us, and um, we uh, there are many things for me to do. So I think that, for example, I intend to write a book on the legality of the Pikuni Sangha in Theravada tradition and uh, about the for and against uh, ideas concerning to this issue, and um, to debate with them. Uh, for our legality and um, and um, the necessity of the Pikuni Sangha in our tradition. Thank you. You you've um, described the resistance. Until now, uh, I got uh, I got approval from uh, many senior monks, but uh, they are not a majority. They are still minority. So we have a long way to go. Okay. What is what is the attitude I'm wondering of ordinary people to your status? Um, I didn't be, uh, again. I cannot hear I, you. I, I was asking what was the attitude of ordinary people, the lay people, to your status? I have problem with the connection. I'm um, sorry. I'm sorry. I'll I, repeat. Uh, I'll repeat the question. Uh, what What is? How do ordinary people regard um, nuns who've taken ordination like you? Do they see you in the same way as the government and the uh, monastic um, community do? Um, you see that um, in now in Vietnam, um, we have um, uh, three three sets, uh, Mahayana, Theravada, and Mendicant. Mendicant is the mixture between Mahayana and Theravada. They also wear yellow robes like us, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, they uh, follow the, they recite the sutra like Mahayana, and they keep vegetarian like Mahayana uh, um, uh, monastics. Uh, so, uh, but three sets, we uh, stay together, we work together in, uh, in the same uh, national Sangha. Mm -hmm. And the, the Pikunis in the Mahayana and the mendicant sets are fully recognized and they are working very well uh, in education, charity, social activities, etc. Uh, but uh, in Theravada tradition, uh, we still have some problems. Uh, but among the nuns, um, we got uh, approval. 
Man Inans uh, asked me to uh, send the letter, official letter to the government and to the Sangha to ask for the full recognition. Um, but uh, I hesitate a little because I know that uh, when the issue uh, are, may, are, are put uh, in our Vietnamese uh, Theravada Sangha, uh, I think that it is not the right time for us to put this question because many people will be will reject the idea. Uh, so, um, and again, another problem is that um, even among the Theravada nuns, um, many nuns do not want to get ordained as a pikuni because they think that it is very difficult to observe on the precepts and uh, and to be uh, and to be independent. So they prefer to continue as a eight precept nun. It is a safer way for them and they can get uh, full um, support from the monks and uh, from many uh, devotees, lay devotees. Mm -hmm. uh, we are um, uh, a little bit uh, uh, discouraged uh, by many conservative monks and also conservative lay devotees. And um, uh, we have to uh, try to make them understand the, what we are doing is uh, rightly. It is uh, not against the Buddha's teaching and not against what the Buddha has uh, and the Sangha in the past has done. So it is our responsibility. And uh, I hope that the other nuns in uh, our tradition will soon understand um, and uh, they will join us in our part. You've already mentioned the, the relationship between Mahayana and Theravada. I'm very interested mm. to know more about that, how the two types of Buddhism coexist mm. in Vietnam. Yeah. Yes. Um, in Vietnam, Mahayana is uh, the majority uh, because um, Mahayana Buddhism was introduced to Vietnam very, very early. We believe that uh, it was uh, introduced to Vietnam uh, nearly 2,000 years ago. Some even believe that uh, it was at the uh, King Asoka's time. Um, and that is why Mahayana Buddhism is very long uh, standing and uh, well established in uh, Vietnam. Um, and in Mahayana Buddhism, uh, there are two um, popular traditions. Uh, first is Pure Land School, and the second is Zen School. Uh, Pure Land School is uh, even more popular. Uh, most of the monks and nuns and lay devotees in Mahayana tradition in Vietnam uh, follow a Pure Land tradition. Uh, they uh, often recite uh, Namo Amitabha Buddha uh, the whole day, and they often organize a seven-day retreat where uh, hundreds or thousands of lay devotees gather at the temple. They stay in the temple the whole week, and they uh, recite the Buddha's name, and uh, they um, um, Pay, in, pay, pay homage to the Buddhas and listen to the Dharma talks. Um, and many temples organize the retreats like that. Um, it is very uh, widespread in Vietnam, uh, pure, pure land tradition. The other sub tradition is Zen tradition uh, in Mahayana Buddhism. Um, and uh, they also have many monasteries where there are uh, more than 200 or 300, sometimes 500 nuns and monks staying in the monastery. And they also organize courses for monasteries and lay people to practice meditation together. Uh, and in um, Theravada tradition, we, we are about 10% of the popular of Buddhists in Vietnam, only 10%. And uh, 
and most of us are in the south, not in the north. In the north, um, um, it is very difficult to uh, to establish a Theravada temple there. Um, so uh, in uh, uh, Theravada Buddhism in Vietnam, we practice uh, Vipassana, and we also have um, meditation centers. And we also organized a seven day or 10 day or one month or even three month uh, retreat for monastics and lay people to practice meditation together. Uh, some, be, some temples um, often invite the meditation masters from uh, Myanmar and uh, Thailand uh, to come to Vietnam uh, to lead the treat, the retreat for the monastics and the Mm, and the lay devotee together. For example, Sapao Sayador or Uchatila or Utechaniya from uh, Myanmar. They are very famous in Vietnam. Uh, some centers by Go and Kaji tradition, um, uh, about two or three in Vietnam are also uh, working here and hundreds of people will join the 10 day courses. Um, so uh, Mahayana and Theravada are working together and um, they will teach the lady devotees in their way, in their method. Uh, sometimes, um, of course, uh, there are some conflicts. Uh, for example, it is conflicts about the ideas uh, some conservative or sometimes some uh, you can say that extremist they will um, um, reject the uh, for, for example some conservative Theravada monks may reject the Mahayana idea and uh, they consider that Mahayana Buddhism is uh, like uh, something affected by the Brahmanism and Hinduism and it is, it is not pure Buddhism and why Mahayana Buddhist is Buddhist also the Kwan Theravada Hinayana and uh, um, they are um, they don't understand each other very well. So it is um, uh, it is um, the situation in Vietnam. But I think that that conflict is not very uh, well spread. It is not severe here, not very serious, because. Uh, we, uh, we attend the same school, the same college, the same university. And that is why uh, Mahayanis also know Theravada uh, teaching. And uh, Theravadi, Theravadin also know the Mahayana teaching. That is why we understand each other and we also accept each other. Yeah. Yes, I, I was um, checking out the website of your university, and I saw there was there was a department for Mahayana studies, a department for Theravada, various language departments, so Pali and Sanskrit, French as well. I saw was studied. C can you tell us about your university a little bit more and and what its work is? Yeah, about the language. Uh, in Vietnam, the Mahayana. Uh, Buddhist. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Uh, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. The connection seems to be rather weak, but but I can hear you. Uh, you know, I think that I have the connection problem. That's why uh, sometimes I can hear you clearly, but sometimes I couldn't. Um, but anyway, I just uh, heard that you asked about the, the language we are using um, uh, for Buddhism in Vietnam. Is it right? Well, I was, I was observing that you taught various languages at your university, and I wanted to know what the university was for, what kind of work it does in, in Vietnam. Is it the only Buddhist university of its kind, mm. or are there many such universities? Okay. Uh, 
uh, now we have a four uh, Buddhist universities in Vietnam. Uh, one in Hanoi, one in Hue, one in Ho Chi Minh City, and one in Cần Thơ City. Uh, the one in Cần Thơ is uh, for Theravada Khmer uh, monastics. And the other three um, are for both Mahayana and Theravada. Uh, so we are a Buddhist university uh, and it is uh, mainly for monks and nuns. But in Ho Chi Minh City, our university uh, also have a correspondence course for lay people. It is a four year course. And after that, uh, the lay devotees can also have the BA degree in Buddhist studies. Uh, for the monks and nuns, um, they are studying here uh, free of charge, uh, with free boarding, uh, free food, everything is uh, free for the monks and nuns. Um, and in my university, um, we have uh, 12 departments. Um, for example, the Pali, philosophy, um, uh, history, um, Dhamma propagation, uh, Sanskrit, Chinese, uh, English. So uh, in my department, uh, Department of Dhamma English, uh, we use English as the medium for teaching. Um, the textbooks uh, and the, the text and the, the letters are all in English. Uh, this is to prepare for our students um, uh, in their future. Uh, you see that uh, if you come to Vietnam, you can see that very few Vietnamese monks and nuns can speak English. Uh, they are not familiar with the English communication. Uh, only those who go out abroad for studies, then they can communicate in English. Otherwise, Vietnamese is the only language we use here. Um, but uh, the people, the students who opt up for the Department of Bapa Dhamma English, um, when they graduate from our university, uh, there are three things they can do. Uh, first. Uh, they can uh, continue their studies abroad. And then with their knowledge in English and Dhamma, it's easier for them to join any universities abroad. The second, they can work as a translator or interpreter uh, to translate books or sutras or the articles uh, or the at uh, international conferences. And the third thing uh, they can do is uh, to become a teacher at Buddhist college or Buddhist schools. Um, because we had the subject uh, English Buddhist terms uh, in the Buddhist schools. So uh, my students will become teachers uh, in those schools. Uh, and in other departments, they use in, uh, Vietnamese as the medium. And uh, after graduation, uh, the monks and nuns can uh, become teachers or they can become the abbot or abbess uh, in their temple, or they can do the, they can join the charity work, social work, etc., uh, according to their wish, or they can go abroad for studies. Uh, you know that now in Myanmar, in Thailand, in Sri Lanka, and in India, um, hundreds of uh, Vietnamese monks and nuns are studying over there. And um, uh, when they come back, they can uh, contribute in uh, the Dhamma propagation in Vietnam very well. In your university, do the Mahayana students study just Mahayana and the Theravada just Theravada, or do they, do they study each other's traditions? We study each other's tradition uh, because uh, in the first two years, um, there are many subjects that is compulsory for all. And uh, it is an uh, introduction to Theravada Buddhism or introduction to Mahayana Buddhism, or Buddhist psychology, Buddhist philosophy. So uh, everyone has to learn the basic Buddhist teaching in both traditions. And after that, they can uh, choose their favorite subjects uh, and uh, in their uh, correspond, uh, corresponding uh, 
um, department uh, according to their wish. But uh, in the first two years, general course, they have to learn uh, in both divisions. I see. Now, now you're both an academic, you're the, you're the deputy head of your university department and you're the abbess of a monastery. So how do, how do you combine these two roles? Hmm. Again, I have connection problem. Can you please uh, repeat? Okay, again? I'm, I'm sorry about this. I was asking how you combine the two roles of um, religious teacher, of abbess of your monastery, and also of academic as deputy head of your department. Ah, I got it. Um, I think that um, it's not uh, so difficult for me because I have uh, um, the cooperation and assistance from my Dharma sisters. Um, as a teacher, uh, uh, at present, I teach as only not only one but three uh, Buddhist schools. Um, one in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, one in uh, Barrio Vung Tau, my uh, my home, my hometown now, and one in Da Nang City, 1,000 kilometers from here. Uh, so sometimes I have to fly to Da Nang to teach there uh, one or two weeks and then come back. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, in my temple, uh, uh, now there are 50 nuns and um, we have some senior uh, nuns who can uh, some are very experienced in meditation and I asked these nuns to guide the other nuns in uh, meditation and some others know English and Pali and uh, Dhamma then they can help me to teach the newcomers um, in these classes so uh, at the beginning, I, I, I took many classes in my temple, but right now I took only one or two classes in my temple. And the rest, uh, I will appoint my Dharma sisters or my students to teach them. So um, I can uh, combine. Sometimes when I teach at university, I can also uh, let my students in the nunnery listen to the to my teaching on the YouTube or um, live. And uh, so they can learn, even though I am not teaching them directly at the monastery, but they can also learn when I teach at the universities or somewhere when I give, uh, go to temples or to uh, um, other cities to give Dharma talks to lay people. Usually people will record it and put on YouTube then my students can also learn from me, but not directly, uh, uh, even though from uh, the internet sources. But I think that uh, um, even though I cannot concentrate uh, completely uh, in my nunnery for my monastic students, but uh, I am always with them and uh, they can ask me, they can talk with me anytime they need um, through phones or through emails or directly when I am at home. Uh, in my temple, when I am at home, uh, I have one, uh, I put one, uh, I have one activity that is um, morning work with teacher. I go ask the, the students who want to talk with me. Uh, about their problems, about their practice. They can register on the paper uh, to have 30 minute morning, morning walk with me every morning. They will take turn. So when we walk together, we will, we will discuss about Dhamma and about their situation, their problem. And usually after 30 minutes, then we can uh, solve many things together. So that is uh, my way of teaching my students. And also once a week, um, we will have the meeting in the monastery uh, where we will uh, 
put on the problems we are facing in the nunnery and then we can talk together and we, we will discuss and find the solution so that we can uh, understand one another and we can do the work better. So in our temples, meetings are very regular uh, where we sit together, we listen to each other. And I think that this is the way so that we can get connected, even though I am not always with them. Thank you. I also like to have walking meetings with my students. So we have something in common there. I, I wanted to ask you whether the Sangha in Vietnam is growing. In other words, are many people wanting to, to become members of the Sangha and particularly are women entering the Sangha? Are you getting lots of recruits for the, for the Bikuni Sangha in Vietnam? Uh, yes, our Sangha is still growing, not uh, decreasing like uh, in other countries. And if you come here, you come to my uh, temple or you come to my class in the university, you can see that they are very young. Uh, their, their average age is about 20s. Uh, in my temple, the average age is about 30s. Uh, they are still very young but they are very faithful. They have understanding in the Dharma and due to the faith to the Dharma, they decide to become a nun even at very young age. And uh, after uh, becoming a nun or a monk, uh, they get um, gradual education uh, in the first in the temples and then in the primary school Buddhist primary school and then Buddhist secondary school, Buddhist college and Buddhist universities. So the, the ed, Buddhist education is very strong here. Uh, with, uh, in the Mahayana temple, uh, the young monks and then start with uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese writing and Chinese chanting and Vietnamese chanting and uh, also the Vinaya runes. And in uh, our temple in Theravada tradition, Everyone must learn uh, Pali because every day we chant in Pali. Uh, so Pali is compulsory for every Theravada monks and nuns. And uh, in my temple, uh, we, uh, we don't go out for arms, uh, but uh, we take turns to cook. The Samaneris and the uh, Anagarika will cook the Fikunis according to the runes we cannot cook but uh, the young nuns can help. And uh, we are getting more and more recruits every year. Uh, you know, uh, I came back to uh, Vietnam from India only in uh, only eight years ago in uh, 2013. And uh, I started receiving students and uh, from zero. And now after eight years, I have uh, 50 uh, young nuns students. Um, and I think that it, and it is still growing. The number is still growing. Uh, every year about five or seven will come. Uh, uh, on uh, uh, next week is our Lunar New Year. And on the first day of the Lunar New Year, we will have a seminary ordination ceremony um, uh, for three, uh, three nuns will become seminary and uh, two ladies will be shaved to become an Anagarika. So uh, every year we have newcomers and the most of them are uh, students at university or they already graduated and went to work, but they found that uh, they are not satisfied with the family life and they would like to become a monastic. So people just uh, keep coming. So the um, you know, um, in the past, people often think that only those who, um, who got failure, who got disappointed um, in their career or in their love life uh, would become a monk or a nun um, as a, a seclusion from the world. But the for example, when the people met me, they also, oh, why, why did you become a nun? Uh, is it because of a broken heart? <laughs> Something like that. 
people often think that because of uh, our failure uh, uh, of our loss, then we we are so sad and we don't know how to do and we come to the temple. But uh, nowadays the situation is uh, opposite. Um, most of the monks and nuns young are very young. They are very uh, optimist. They are very positive. And because they understand the Dhamma, uh, because they want to have the peaceful life, and because they want to serve the community in the best in the best way, then they decide to become monks and nuns, not because they cannot uh, um, su succeed in life or they are not satisfied with the with the world. So I think that this is a very <clears throat> good sign for our Sangha. That's very encouraging. Uh, thank you. I'm I'm going to um, ask uh, one of our students now, Ralph Craig, to um, to moderate the questions, uh, which I hope um, uh, people listening out there will put in the Q and A function at the bottom of the screen, and we have some in the chat as well, which I hope Ralph has picked up. Very good. And so, Ralph, would you like to take it away? Uh, I Thank you for your talk and telling us about your life. Uh, one of the questions we have, I know you touched a little bit on this before, but if you could elaborate, when and how did you become a bhikkhuni preceptor? Uh, so maybe a little bit more about your journey. Mm. Um, I became a preceptor in uh, 2014. <clears throat> it was uh, 12 years after my ordination, according to the Vinaya. <clears throat> At the time, <clears throat> in 2014, I took my three students um, to go to Sri Lanka uh, to get the Pikuni ordination. Um, <clears throat> At that uh, ceremony before the ordination, a uh, venerable Tamananda from Thailand uh, requested the um, Sri Lankan uh, senior pickles, uh, who were our who are our masters, uh, to give me permission to become a pavatini or the preceptor. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, at the time, they consider that uh, I was ordained for twelve years, and I have uh, enough knowledge to become <clears throat> a teacher, so that I can guide my students in the Dhamma and Vinaya. So uh, they think that I am qualified enough. So they, uh, 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 in the Pikku Sangha, they decided to uh, appoint me as a Tavatini. And they also gave me the certificate of uh, appointment uh, as a Tavatini. So it was in uh, January of uh, 2014 in Sri Lanka. And since then, um, I had, uh, I, had to be, I have become Pavat, either Pavatini uh, preceptors or Kamma Vajacharini. Uh, it means that uh, the, the teacher who will recite on the, uh, the Sangha Kama in Pali um, to make the procedure of the ceremony in order uh, in Pali language. And another duty uh, I often do is uh, to give uh, Vinaya training to the newly ordained or the uh, or even before the the ordination. I will go in advance uh, for one or two weeks to give instruction to the candidates, either before or after the ordination. So I am the one who uh, give the training to the international pikuni um, who join the sangha as a pikuni. Thank you. Uh, one of our professors, Professor John Kishnick, asked, you mentioned that on your walks, your students come to discuss, come to you to discuss their problems. What sort of problems do they discuss with you? Mm. Usually their problem is, um, uh, mm, relationship problem or problems in their own practice. Uh, you know, uh, there are many nuns in my temple uh, now, at right now, 50 of them. 
So they come from uh, different regions, uh, different backgrounds, and they have different characteristics, uh, tendencies. So sometimes when they work together, when they stay together, uh, they, they have some conflict in ideas or uh, in way of life, and uh, they feel uh, uneasy, they feel unhappy, even unhappy. So they don't know how to deal with other people, and that sometimes they don't know how to deal with their own def mental defilements. So when they come and walk with me in the morning, they will tell me the story, um, their, prob their own problems, and uh, they will ask me how to deal with this. So I will first, I will listen, and then I will give some advice. And after that, I will uh, recheck whether they can overcome their own problems or not. And if not, then we will work together for many other times, if necessary so that they can uh, uh, get progress in their practice. So to that end, can you tell us about your interactions with the laity? Relation with what? Uh, with the laity? I, I can't hear you clearly. Can you... With the laity? Uh, laity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can okay. you tell us about your interaction? We have very good yeah. relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have very good relationship with the laity, uh, lay people. You mean? Uh, you know, uh, in Buddhism, monks and nuns uh, are not allowed to earn a living. Uh, we don't go for to work. We don't get a salary. So. Um, our requisites, daily requisites, like uh, ropes and foods and lodging, uh, even uh, transportation, everything is uh, depend, dependent on the of donation of the laity. And uh, for example, um, for our food, uh, you know that uh, we, we don't have dinner. Huh? In, in my nunnery, we have only breakfast and lunch. So for 50 people, uh, the, uh, the fee the, for food is about 50 US dollars a day. Uh, one nun will we, we about uh, one dollar. So how, how if we don't have salary, we don't have regular income, how can we uh, uh, support the big sangha like that? Uh, so we have a system of donation. Uh, we, uh, we will call the, the, the family, each family will offer one meal a month for the Sangha. And if not, is, uh, if one family cannot afford, then they can uh, group together two or three family uh, so they can donate one day of food um, it uh, equal to 50 US dollars a month uh, to support the nuns. So from the beginning of the year, we will have the list of donors for our food, daily food. So uh, if we have uh, 30 families or 30 groups uh, as the donors, a regular donor, um, and usually we have um, a bank account of the nunnery. Uh, so they will transfer the money to the bank account and our helpers and our anagarikas uh, will, uh, with the money uh, uh, provided by the laity community, then we can uh, we can survive um, without uh, worrying about the salary or income. And um, we also have the fund for health. Uh, we, we, we have fund for construction and we have fund for education. So uh, if people come and ask, how can I help? So we can say that, oh, we have those kind of uh, contribution. We can, if you like, you can contribute in fooding or you can contribute in the construction or uh, health, uh, et cetera. So they, they can uh, donate in that way and um, we can... Uh, 
uh, support our Sangha in that way. Mm. Thank you. Another one of our professors, Professor James Gentry asks, he says, I'm impressed by your university and that the Sangha can study for free. Could you share where the funding comes from for the university and what challenges you have faced in keeping the university going? Uh, um, you know, our university uh, does not get any financial support from the government. So on the support, comes from the lay community. Um, so uh, we, we are proud to say that uh, our lady community in Vietnam uh, is very strong and very faithful. They have the belief that uh, if they uh, help to uh, uh, educate, to help in the education of young monks and nuns, this is the future of Buddhism. And if Buddhism prosper, then the country will prosper and they can help to make the society happier. So with this belief in mind, people will generously donate to the universities and to the meditation centers and to the monasteries and nunneries. They are willing to share their incomes and to donate monthly or yearly to the fund of the university. Uh, there is one uh, big group uh, in Vietnam, Vin Group. Uh, they have supermarkets, they have a building construction company. Then every day they will bring 300 kilograms of vegetables uh, to the university to provide the kitchen. And some people will, uh, the groups, uh, these groups, that group from many parts of the country, they will register to offer one day food uh, to the university. So they take turn to offer. So in that way, um, the, still, the university can uh, exist and uh, develop without any regular financial support from the, uni the, the government or anyone but only mainly based on the contribution of the lay people. Wow, that is so encouraging to hear. About how many bhikkhunis and novices are living and training at your nunnery? Um, now we have uh, 50 uh, bhikkhunis and samaneris and anagarikas in our temple. Um, we have many stages of training. For example, a lay a woman uh, would like to join our Sangha. First of all, they have to stay as a layman, lay woman for six months so that uh, they can fight themselves whether um, it is suitable for them to become a nun or not. And from outside, we will observe them to see whether they are sincere or serious in becoming a nun or not. Both sides are investigating. And after six months, if they find that, oh, this is the right way for me and I really want to become a member of the Sangha, then they ask permission to officially become a member of the Sangha. And if we consider them and we see that this lady is also uh, um, qualified to become a member, then we will accept them. And then we will uh, shave them uh, and uh, let them become an anagarika, the first stage. And uh, they will keep eight precept. Then they will keep eight precept as, as an anagarika for two months, sorry, for two years, for two years. During that time, they have to learn many subjects. Uh, sutras, uh, Vinaya, Avitama, Pali, English, and working. Uh, here in our temple, we work in the morning. Um, so I can, I can say you uh, uh, generally about our routine. We get up at four o'clock in the morning, um, and then uh, morning session uh, start at 4.30 with 15 minutes Pali chanting and one hour 
meditation. After that, we have half an hour for um, exercises, morning exercise, and uh, then breakfast at six o'clock. Then from seven to 10 a.m., this is the work, labor work. Uh, we work in the garden. You know, our temple is uh, quite large, uh, 10 acres. Uh, so we have a vegetable garden, we have a, man, uh, a M, um, mango garden, we have a cherry garden, we have a bamboo, uh, uh, sorry, a uh, um, banana garden. So um, the nuns have to take turn to sweep the garden and also to, to take care of the plants. So we work three hours in the morning and after that lunch is we stop at uh, 10, lunch is at uh, 10.30, but after lunch, no more work. Uh, it is time for classes and meditation and uh, reading books. So uh, for uh, the Anagorica, they have to spend uh, two years before they can get seminary ordination uh, with the two more precepts. They become 10 precepts. And then after seminary, again, they have to spend two to three years uh, to become a fully ordained pikuni. Uh, so if we get pikuni ordination, we have to observe 311 rooms. So then at, that is why before that, they have to learn very um, carefully every rooms so that they can decide whether they can keep such so many runes or not. If they think that it's okay, I can do it, then they can go ahead with ordination. Otherwise they said, oh, um, let me stay with the salmonaries. It's easier and safer for us, then they can. Uh, so it is the, the way of training in our temple. And about how many ladies can the temple accommodate at a time? Uh, at the time now we have uh, uh, five ladies. Uh, two will be saved. Uh, you see, three, three will be saved uh, next week. Three are qualified enough. It means that after six months. But you see, they two of them came to me two days ago, and they said that, "Oh, Master, um, let me so let me have some more time before saving." So. Uh, <laughs> I'm not ready to shave my hair now. So only one is ready. You see, it's not easy because shaving is a very uh, decisive uh, step in your life. You renou renunciate the, you have to renounce the world and wear the monastic robe and your life is quite changed. That is why two, has asked me to uh, uh, to postpone their shaving. <laughs> oh wow, what a difficult but powerful decision. Uh, are young people in Vietnam interested in Buddhism or religion in general? Yes, um, I think uh, it is because of um, our long-standing tradition of Buddhism in Vietnam. And we have many ways of uh, Buddhist education for children. Um, you know, uh, I remember in uh, the Sakatita conference in Hong Kong, I wrote a paper um, entitled uh, Dhamma Education for Children in Vietnam. So in that paper, I uh, described two ways of uh, Buddhist education for children. The first is the uh, one organization named Buddhist Family. And this organization was started, um, I think uh, in 1950, uh, nearly 70 years ago. And when I was young, I was a member of that organization. Every, it is uh, similar to Boy Scout or Girl Scouts uh, in, uh, in, in the West. Every, more, uh, every Sunday afternoon, uh, we will go to the temple, we will learn the Dhamma, we will learn the Buddhist uh, stories, and we also learn a little bit of chanting. And also we have some games, some songs like Boy Scouts. 
sometimes we go camping uh, together. So um, it is regular every Sunday afternoon. Another way of uh, Buddhist education is summer camps for children organized by the monastic monks and nuns. For example, in my nunnery every year in June, right after the children um, stop the school and start their summer vacation, we will organize the one week summer camp in our nunnery. Uh, 200, because my temple is quite small, we only accept 200. In uh, Huang Fa Temple, they receive 5,000 5, uh, students come and stay in the temple for one week. When we provide food and lodging for them, and they stay with us, and during the summer camp, we teach them a lot. Uh, the Dhamma teaching and also how to behave with teach teachers and um, family, parents. And uh, you see, uh, after one week, they stay with us in the temple. We take care of their food, their meals, their, their sleep. So we have, we, we have uh, um, built, we, we can build a very good relationship between the monks and the nuns and the children. Um, I noticed that after the camps, uh, when they return with their parents to the temple, they are more uh, friendly, they are more close to the monks and the nuns than before. Uh, and uh, their parents will take them to the temples whenever we have the ceremony. Um, we also encourage them to read the Buddhist books for children. And we even give them consultation when they need, because you know that uh, sometimes parents cannot help them, but the parents told them that the monks and nuns are very uh, uh, gentle and very uh, helpful and very friendly. So they send the children to us and they, they, we encourage them to tell us the stories. They, we listen and then we give them instruction or advices. So that, uh, that is the way how we educate the young people to attract them to Buddhism and to make Buddhism help them in their life. I see. Could you say a little bit more about chanting? Earlier you, you mentioned chanting. I was wondering if you could say more about the practice of chanting, the experience of chanting. Yes, uh, in most of the temples, chanting is uh, compulsory for all the monastics. Uh, chanting means we repeat the Buddha's teaching, the basic Buddha's teaching so that uh, it reminds us of the, our way of practice. Uh, it reminds us of our purpose of life. And uh, it reminds us of our um, good intention um, from the day we renounce the world. This re reminding is very important. Um, so uh, usually we have uh, two times for chanting, one early in the morning and one in the evening. Uh, usually we chant together. Uh, we will take turn to lead the chanting. Everyone uh, will have the opportunity to lead the chanting. Um, and in our temple, we will, learn, we will chant in Pali and Vietnamese. Um, for the Pali chanting, uh, you know, in Theravada tradition, uh, even though uh, you go to every country. For example, if I go to Venerable Tatalog uh, temples in uh, San Francisco in the, in the USA, we can also chant together. Uh, the same sutras and the same rhythm. So we don't have any problems when we join the international Piku or Piku Di Sangha. I think that it is a very strong point of Theravada Buddhism. Uh, in Mahayana Buddhism, 
uh, they chant in their own language. China chants in Chinese, Korean, Chinese, in Korean language, Vietnamese also. Uh, that is why when they come together, they don't have the common language. Uh, Sanskrit should be the common language, but you see that uh, no one chant in Sanskrit now, I think, except uh, Tibetan monks. Uh, uh, maybe Professor Harrison know about this. <laughs> very few people can chant in Sanskrit now, but Pali is very, still very popular in the Theravada community, and it is our strong point. We can be uh, uh, together very easily, harmoniously. I see. Professor James Gentry asks again, he says, over the past few years, I've noticed that Vietnamese Mahayana Sangha members have been traveling to Nepal to study the Tibetan language. Does this reflect a growing interest in Tibetan Buddhism in Vietnam? Um, let me see. Uh, let me see. I I can 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 you can you pass the question to me? Uh, I cannot hear the questions very clearly. Uh, is there any question there? The question yes. uh, test? Uh -huh. uh, I will uh, can, can you send it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thank you. Uh, is there a, oh, let me see, where is it? <laughs> Uh, um, let let me see where where is your where is your chat? <laughs> <laughs> it is a confusing <laughs> system. It's, it's okay. Let, let me try. Let me try chat. Okay. Uh, is that is there a growing interest? No, no. Mm -hmm. Let me yes. see. That's the question. Is, uh, can you repeat the question? I think now yes. I can hear you. Is uh, there a growing interest in Tibetan Buddhism in Vietnam? Yes, I think so. Um, recently, I saw many uh, Tibetan masters were invited to Vietnam uh, to give Dharma talks and uh, to conduct um, ceremonies in uh, Tibetan tradition. Um, you know that the Dalai Lama is uh, beloved to everyone. Um, and also many books uh, about Tibetan, Tibetan tradition, like uh, uh, Tibetan masters, and uh, many books were translated into Vietnamese, um, telling the story of great uh, Tibetan masters like uh, Milarepa uh, or um, Venerable Tenzin Panmo 12 years in the snow, uh, to snow caves. Uh, so, uh, and uh, Kamapa's uh, stories. So, people are interested in the Tibetan um, heritage. That is why um, I think that. The, Today, there is a growing interest in uh, Tibetan tradition in Vietnam. Oh, wow. Uh, we have another question that asks, may, may I ask why you, did you decide to be ordained as a Theravada bhikkhuni instead of a Mahayana bhikkhuni? Okay. Um, I was in Mahayana tradition for three years before I uh, diverted to a Theravada tradition. Um, in the beginning uh, time of my uh, monastic life, uh, I was in uh, two Mahayana nunneries and it uh, followed the Pure Land tradition. Uh, and you know that uh, in Pure Land tradition, they um, spend so much time for chanting and praying and um, pro prostrating. Um, you know that, uh, you know the pro prostrating, uh, uh, kneeling down, sometimes one day, 
1,000 times of prostrating. So, uh, and chanting also too much, two, three hours a day. Um, sometimes I was sweating the whole three, many times a day, I was sweating. I was wet with sweat. Uh, and I was wondering oh, why we have to work this way because I prefer sitting in meditation very peacefully and um, we don't need to <laughs> spend so much energy for this kind of uh, proper straighting. That is why uh, I think that the, 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 the way a practice in pure land tradition doesn't suit me. Uh, I prefer meditation, but uh, at that time, even Zen tradition is also Zen tradition in Vietnam is also uh, requires sitting too much. Uh, sometimes they require sitting three hours in a session. Uh, so I prefer Vipassana, uh, which is uh, meditation in daily life. Uh, you keep mindful and watchful in everything you do, in everything you say, in uh, every state of your mind. Uh, just observe uh, mindfully, aware, uh, aware with awareness. So I think that because um, that is why that is the way the reason why I changed from a Mahayana tradition to Theravada tradition. Uh, even though at that time many people told me that if I um, follow the Theravada tradition, I will lose the opportunity to be fully ordained as a fikuni uh, because at that time uh, there, there were no fikunis in Theravada tradition. But I say, okay, uh, uh, the status um, or the position is not so important, but the practice and the achievement in your practice, your peace and your wisdom is more important. So. Uh, I think that even though it is a sacrifice, I'm ready to sacrifice. But uh, fortunately, um, I, I became the pioneer to uh, re-establish the Pikuni Sangha in uh, Theravada tradition. And uh, um, I paid the way for, the, uh, for my uh, sisters, for my students so that now they can also get fully ordained in Theravada tradition. Uh, so I think that uh, it seems like I have a mission to do uh, in Theravada tradition. To that end, can you share what is your vision for the future of the revived Theravada Bhikkhuni Sangha in Vietnam and internationally? Mm. I, I hope that, and I strongly think that uh, we will have a bright future um, for the Pikuni Sangha in Vietnam and international. Um, because um, I, I believe in our seriousness in practice. Um, you know, my, my master is a monk, a Piku. He always support us. Every week he came to our temple to teach us. And he told us, uh, I, I, I really like one, one of his advice. He told us that you don't need to try to persuade people to recognize you. You just try to make yourself strong and uh, brilliant enough so that they have to recognize you. Uh, when you are good enough, then you don't need to require them to recognize you. So what we need to do now is to improve ourselves, to observe receipt very uh, straightfully, uh, to learn the Dhamma very seriously, and to contribute in the Dhamma propagation to help people. And to um, together with the Pikku Sangha, we also help the people um, in the community. So if we do everything well, and if we can, we can, uh, you know, people, people usually say that, how can you keep the Pikuni precepts in this modern time? Uh, 
for example, one rule is that um, we don't we uh, are not allowed to receive money uh, for our own. Uh, so many people, even now, many monks and nuns in Vietnam, even in Theravada tradition, they cannot keep this precept because they have to um, spend for so many things in their temple. But we try to do it because we have very good example from the Western community, like Achan Brahma Vangso in Australia um, and uh, even Ayatatha Loka in America, uh, they have the big community, but they don't need to uh, worry about money. They will appoint the lay devotees to take care of the financial problem. Uh, so I started the same thing in my nunnery. And now in my nunnery, we don't have our own money. We don't accept money for individual. So if people come to offer the money, we will, uh, we will have one anagarika to keep the fund as a treasurer, and then everything we put in the fund. And if we need anything, the treasurer will take care of, of that for us. And I think that um, until now, we may say that we are the only temple in the country can do that thing, that we don't keep the money for, for each people. It is the common money for everyone. But if we, if we try to do, if we want to do, we can do it. Uh, so uh, we are now very happy that we can do it. And many other monks and nuns, they also uh, appreciate it. Uh, and because of that reason, we strongly believe that the Pikuni Sangha in Theravada tradition will be uh, recognize because we are trying to do whatever uh, necessary and required uh, so that um, we are worthy to be with it. Thank you. In your experience, this is from Professor Anna, also in our department, in your experience in the Theravada world, is there much difference between the countries and the way Buddhist nuns are regarded. Yes. Um, 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 in Theravada country, the status of nuns is very low, I can say. Uh, if you go to Thailand and even in Vietnam, uh, the nuns uh, in Theravada tradition uh, keep only eight precepts and they wear white. And you see, white, white clothes is uh, considered only for the lay people. I don't know why the senior monks in uh, Theravada countries like Thailand and Myanmar choose the white color and the pink color for the Theravada nuns in their community. It is uh, very ironical because white and pink is only reserved for lay people, but they chose white and pink for monastics who renounce the world to become a monastic for long, for life. Uh, and you know that in the uh, Theravada monks, temples where monks and nuns stay together, the nuns have to cook, have to cook, to clean, to do everything to serve the monks. And uh, even when, the, when they finish the cooking, eh, they have to serve all the food to the monks. And then after the monks finish their meal, what is the leftover? That will be for the nuns and for the lay people. Um, it is the, the situation of the white robe nuns in the Theravada country in Southeast Asian country right now. And, uh, um, but we are fortunate that we have a very kind master. Uh, when we, he, is, he opens a, a nunnery for us, uh, he gives us a equal, uh, e equality with the monk. 
not not uh, completely completely equal, but at least um, we have a quarter for monks and quarter for nuns, and we have separate kitchen, and then we don't need to wait for the monks to finish their meal so that we can have our meal. Uh, so we at least, uh, and now in our nunnery, uh, we are independent. Uh, we also have the monks' quarter, but uh, everything is separate. Even the chanting time, the chanting horn, or the fund, everything. It is like a two temples. Um, I think that um, in order to do so, the nuns uh, should be equipped with um, knowledge and um, uh, confidence and also ability to, um, to survive, to exist independently and uh, to deserve the donation from the lay people. When people think, when people see that the nuns can teach us, the nuns can guide us, and the nuns can be equal to the monks, then, then they can change their attitude. So uh, even, uh, even though now the, uh, the situation is not very, uh, uh, very good for the Theravada nuns, but I hope that in the future, the situation will change. Thank you so much for that. I'm gonna turn it back to Paul now. Hmm. Yes, uh, thank you. I think we've got time for uh, one more question. Um, it comes from another one of our um, one of our, our postdoctoral fellow, in fact, who who um, uh, remarks that he's enjoyed listening to your talks on YouTube for the past two months, and and has appreciated the way you engage uh, your audiences with a really accessible and interactive um, style of presentation. But, but one thing he's noticed um, is that um, the audience applauds during lectures and uh, at your lectures and other lectures by Vietnamese monastics. And um, so uh, he finds this bursting into applause rather unusual um, and unique to contemporary Vietnamese communities. So he, he, was, he was wondering if you could say something about the um, the role of applause in in Buddhist sermons and in other rituals. Uh, the role of what? Applause when pe when people clap during. Ah, applaud. Yeah. Ah. The role of the applaud in of, of applauding, yes, because he. He, he remarks that this, this seems to be unique to Vietnam. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, 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 now, now I see the question now. Yep. Uh, I see. Um, you see that uh, usually in uh, Mahayana tradition, um, yes, uh, when uh, some uh, monks and nuns uh, give Dharma talk, and if they found it is so interesting, they applaud. Uh, and it is it seems accepted acceptable in Mahayana tradition, but in Theravada tradition, um, we don't use applaud, but we have the the word satu 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 in Pali means well done well done. Um, so uh, it is uh, now very popular in the Theravada tradition. Uh, so. Um, when people are happy with whatever we say or, or whatever we do, they will say sadhu, sadhu, very loudly. And uh, I think that it is also equal to the applauding. And it's also encouraged, encouraging us very well. Uh, so I think that it uh, is uh, depending on the tradition. In Mahayana tradition, uh, it uh, is okay. But in our tradition, uh, it is not so appropriate. So I would suggest people to use the word satu uh, to manifest, um, express their um, appreciation. Okay, that, that is a very appropriate note to end on. Uh, I, this has been fascinating. I, I, 
I'd like to thank you for persisting through our technical difficulties and, and sharing with us this, this really a very interesting insight into Vietnamese Buddhism and to, and to the uh, role of the nuns in it. And so, so although you cannot hear the clapping or the applause from the audience, um, certainly that we have many sadhus appearing uh, in the chat and, and, and <laughs> I, on behalf of everybody and the host center, I'd like to say sadhu sadhu sa to you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so thank you very much, Professor and uh, uh, Miss Irene and uh, Ralph for conducting this uh, <clears throat> talk with us. I also introduce my students to come here to join the event so that they can learn something from uh, the teachers and the students here. And again, I would like to say thank you to Ayatata Loka, uh, my uh, senior and uh, close friend uh, for bringing me to this uh, opportunity uh, to talk with uh, knowledgeable people like you. So thank you very much um, to be with us. And I wish you very uh, good health and peace in mind and success in your life. Thank you. Thank you very much.